Welcome back at WNST, Taos from Baltimore and Baltimore Positive. We have merged the streams from almost 30 years of doing sports radio to what we're doing at Baltimore Positive right now, which is mixing things up, talking some politics, some art, some music, some local stuff. But that's not what this segment's about. And I'll tell you what, um, my dad loved baseball and, you know, everybody knows my last name and being raised. But when I say my dad, my, I'm talking about my pop, who was not an Aparicio at all, but who loved baseball and uh, saw Babe Ruth play at Yankee Stadium in his childhood, uh, taking the train in from Scranton, Pennsylvania with his dad. Um, and so I had all these stories, but my dad's tallest stories were always about guys who didn't make it. And in 1973, 74, 75, and I enjoyed this book called Seasons in Hell by Mike Shropshire that I would recommend to anybody who loves a good baseball book. And that's what this segment is about. But uh, my dad would always talk about David Clyde in the early 70s and hold on to his baseball card. He's going to be. And then about 1976 or 77, my dad's like, ah, he was the, the next Dalkowski. He, you know. So Steve Dalkowski became – the guy with all the talent who never made it. The book is called Dalco. Uh, I want to welcome on Brian Vikander. They might pronounce that for me, Brian, so I get it right because I want to. I want to get it right. Vikander. Vikander on every reference. Um, a photographer by trade, and that's a hell of a picture of Steve Dalkowski. The untold story of baseball's fastest pitcher. You know, uh, this is a. Uh, Baltimore Paz is a little bit like the godfather uh, around here because every time they try to pull me out of sports and I have a Ben Cardin or a John Sarbanes or a Martin O'Malley, we're talking about elections and Trump and Biden, they pulled me back to baseball because that's what I know best, Brian. So uh, congratulations on getting this thing done. I've been waiting a couple months to have you on. Uh, when they said to me, Steve Dalkowski in a book, I said, well, I'm going to have you on, then I'm going to have John Eisenberg on to tell me some more stories because this is the kind of stuff I couldn't get enough of when I was a kid. So uh, thank you for putting this thing together. Tell me about Steve Dalkowski, Brian. The last great American sports legend, period. There will never be anything like Dalco ever again. We know about something uh, minutes after, seconds after it happens in today's sports world. Dalkowski was truly the journey of the hero, wasn't he? Well, he departed. He yeah, my, my dad and, would tell me all of this stuff, just about how the, the legend, Sid Finch sort of legend with the fastball, right? Well, that's absolutely right. George Plimpton was a good buddy of mine. We used to hold court at the Mayflower in Washington, D.C., across from National Geographic with my photo editor. And we had a heck of a time. Hunter S. Thompson joined us one time. We held such a party in there that Tip O'Neill and Baker didn't even go back to the Senate. I want to hear you. We're going to do this after the show. You and I are going to talk about Hunter S. Thompson <laughs> having a few beverages. Uh, you know, uh, I've lived my life on the edge as well, uh, you know, and, and become the topic as well. But I, I'm not going to do that this time. Why this book? And uh, tell everybody about your – I mean, you're a photographer by trade. So give everybody your, your story about why this became a book. I first heard about Dalco in 1960 as a little leaguer. He was playing up in Stockton. As a little leaguer, I knew all 16 major league teams. I knew the starting lineups on every team. I didn't really know about minor league baseball. And then all the kids in the neighborhood got together. We thought we'd all be at Dalco that day and see who could throw the hardest. Later that year, my father found an article in Time Magazine describing Dalkowski, and I've been following him for 60 years. It's been, it's been incredible. And the myths, the legends, the stories continued to grow, and they were a burden to Steve, ultimately, to have to carry all this stuff around. He couldn't simply be himself. I think it would, it would really speak to current times for anybody who's a little younger in the audience, or even some people that are older like me that have seen times change. I'm 52 now, so I'm getting there, but I've been on the air 30 years here, and I've watched this thing go from being where I had to have a newspaper next to me, which was the only way to look anything up, uh, and then the internet, the early web pages would come along, and I had the old baseball encyclopedia next to me to pull out stats. These are the ways – Sports Illustrated, you know, sporting news, those kind of things were the ways to find information. And I can only imagine in the modern era, back then, if you were a baseball player, unless you're a racehorse, right, or a boxer, uh, being a baseball player was all of the sports wrapped into one, right? It was the American dream. Uh, I, I would think at this point you're about to go into Mickey Mantle and Roger Maris and, you know, integration of the sport and – 
baseball is just such a giant part of America. He was the great sort of hope, right? I mean, he was for everyone. He, he was uh, LeBron James and Peyton Manning and, you know, all of that number one draft pick that we've all sort of put into other silos in the modern era. He was all of that in one place, almost like an astronaut, right? Absolutely right. And what we've tried to do here is distill out the truth from all of the myths, the lies, the exaggerations, and how this legend continued to grow. Dalkowski became objectified over time. He lost his human quality, not because he wanted to relinquish it. It was taken from him. What we've tried to do in the book is bring that human quality back because failure is something that we all deal with. We all recognize it. We all understand it. Steve was a person, too. He was a human being and a good one, a very good person. You know, Brian, I I would say it's almost like the way you speak of him is almost being like a child actor. And, And I guess maybe what I was trying to succinctly say that I didn't say very succinctly was... We are now in ESPN where we have these 14-year-old children like holding hats in front of them as to which high school they're going to go to. And then, you know, I showed up at Mount St. Joe the, the, the day that uh, the kid declared to go to Maryland. 800 people around the building. ESPN's there. They got three hats, and it's like a shell game. And, you know, we – Every kid gets that now. Every kid has Instagram. And, I mean, you're in the photography business. We're, you know, we're all of that, that wasn't the way it was then, right? There was no sort of script for how to be the next great thing unless you were. There was anything like that. Dalco was only just out of high school when every major league team sent a representative to his house in an effort to get his name on a contract. Everybody recognized that he was wild. He did have control problems. Everybody felt they could figure this out. Just like Koufax had control problems. First six years he's in the major leagues, he goes 36 and 40. The next six years he goes 129 and 47, perhaps the six best years ever. And they figured they could get that out of Dalco at some point in time. And nobody was even beaten on the trash cans in the locker at that point, right? That's true. Brian Vikander joining us here. The book is Dalco, uh, written along with uh, two other folks here, Bill Dembski, Alex Thomas, uh, the forward by Sudden Sam McDowell, one of the uh, favorites of my pal Tom Cap. Uh, Give me the Dalco story in a nutshell in regard to his background uh, and growing up and – how we got to the Orioles, because, you know, I don't know that if he were a Kansas City Royal, and I've already given you David Clyde, and look, I'm a baseball nerd, right, at heart, mm-hmm. or at least I was most of my life. I don't know what the hell I am anymore, uh, which is why I'm moving this thing around and only geezing about old baseball stuff when most people in my audience can't name five Baltimore Orioles right now in Baltimore. But this was a guy who never made it, and, and I was born in 68, right? So my dad started telling me stories in 72, 73, 74, 75, Give me the the Steve Dalkowski story about finding Baltimore and how the Orioles wound up with him and where he was from, because I I don't know that part, and I'm holding the book. He was uh, raised in New Britain, Connecticut. It was a working-class community, a lot of hardworking people, and he was a fireball pitcher from the time that he was 13 years of age. Everybody knew of him, and through his high school career, he gathered crowds of five to 800 people in a time when you didn't get crowds like that at high school games to watch him pitch. Baltimore Orioles won the bid to, to, to get Dalco. Uh, there's a little question about what it was. There was a limit on the amount of money they could give to a player. They gave him the 4,000. It's reputed that there was 12,000 under the table plus a, a Pontiac, a blue Pontiac that Dalco got. Several days later, he was on his way to now, the Is that reputed or is that career. factual? I mean, is there, is there is 60 years of statute of limitations on the, uh, on the uh, blue vehicle? Blue vehicles are given. They did have that. Where it went, nobody knows. Nobody knows where the car went. He didn't take it with him. They don't know where it didn't stay at the house. I don't know where, where the car went. But the, the car is legit, absolutely. Steve Dalkowski passed away in April of 2020 at the age of 80. I guess that was probably, uh, given the hard and fast life, I was kind of shocked when he passed that he was still alive because he was not a guy that surfaced much. I I remember at one point he came and threw out a first pitch. I had to Google that to remember that that was now 17 years ago. I never met him. I never had him on the show. Um, 
I, I've known some other people in the aftermath of baseball with all sorts of off the field issues. And now in football that I become older and we've had 25 years of football here, we've lost some football players, uh, young, including Orlando Brown's father, uh, you know, passing away. So we've had all sorts of tragedy in sports, right? Through my 30 years of doing this on the radio, mm -hmm. but I literally had forgotten about Steve Dalkowski and the, the name never came up. And when I think of him, I literally think of John Eisenberg writing about him because until this book, it was one of the parts that kept the legend alive because my dad's been dead 28 years. You know, my dad hasn't told me a Dalkowski story. And for my dad, his story is probably no different than you as a little boy, you know, throwing the hits. I would always ask my dad, did anybody ever throw faster than Nolan Ryan? And, you know, he'd say, ah, oh, you didn't see Dalkowski throw, you know, like, so, so knowing all of that, there, there is some, um, some Sid Finchy part to me to, to your point, to dehumanize him, right? To, to, to me, he is Sid Finch. He's a guy that never existed, although he existed. And I, from all accounts, had a very difficult existence. True fact. And, and George Plimpton tried to give human qualities to Sid Finch and bring Dalco alive. He was important in keeping the legend alive, just as Pat Jordan was with his marvelous articles over, over time. Uh, it, it was important that somebody keep those legends there. But the distillation of truth never happened. The legends simply continued to grow, whether it was drinking, whether it was speed, whether it was number of people's ears he took off in the batter's box. All this stuff continued to grow until we got this distillation down in the book. Well, uh, did you know Steve Dalkowski? I did not. I had, um, you know, Dalco had alcohol-induced dementia. And when he was brought back to New Britain in his late 50s, he went into a rest home. He was there for the rest of his life. How much he understood in a cognitive sense is, is hard to determine. I had a couple of telephone conversations with Dalco over the years, and I'm not sure what he did or didn't understand. We had hoped, Nestor, that we would have been able to get to Dalco before he passed and present this book to him. That's what our goal was. We wanted him to have this book in his own hands. Whether he knew who it was or knew, knew what was inside, we had hoped that we would be able to do that, and it didn't work out. And after all this dude had been through, come on, you know, he was drinking the cheapest rot gut wine for years and decades, the kind of stuff that toasts your brain. Well, he didn't get any real money, the right? Planet. The only money he ever got was the money he got under the table in four grand, right? Like, he, he never really – in the modern era when you don't make it or you're Andrew Luck and you just walk away from it, you're the, you know, the number one – you go home with money, no, no matter how yeah. big a bust you are. Even Ryan Leaf, we've had him on the show many times uh, talking about his travels and, uh, you know, his resurrection. And, um, mm -hmm. you know, that, he had a lot of money at one point, right? Dalco never had a lot of money, right? Literally. No, absolutely. Absolutely. Minor league existence back then meant zero. Uh, and so he, he didn't have a lot of money. That's absolutely correct. Now, when they say rich and famous is, is, you know, being rich is good, being famous not so good, being poor and famous, wow, right? Like – uh, and and being famous for having failed. Like, I mean, when I mentioned Ryan Leaf or, you know, people that have sort of overcome that, right, you know, in, in mm -hmm. whatever way, character, reputation, whatever. For so, so paint a little bit of a story about not making it. Tell me about Dalco in the 60s and him not making it because it wasn't for – Look, we, even in the modern era, Antonio Brown's out catching passes this week, right? Like, literally, they will continue to give you chances, no matter what, if you can do this. They gave him chances, and he was going to be – he was fitted for a uniform in spring training of 1963. He was going to be on the 25-man roster for the Orioles, and he blew his arm out. His UCL is what we suspect it was, and – you know, the trainer for the Orioles at that time was the guy who had changed the scoreboard numbers the year before, and he'd been the bat boy the year before that. Obviously, he didn't come out of Johns Hopkins and understanding about medicine. And the only thing they could recommend for people at that point in time was rest, put a little ice on it, put a little heat on it, don't throw curveballs, and let's hope it gets better. Well, that he'd been on, the, been on the train to try and make the major leagues for a number of years by this point, and he knew that the dream was slipping away. We suspect, Nestor, that it, does, that it came from abuse, not the alcohol, 
well-intentioned coaches that did not know how to teach pitching. They always monkeyed with his mechanics. And as a pitching coach, having worked with Cy Young Award winners, Major League All-Stars, frontline guys, it's timing first. It's how you get from first forward movement to foot strike, foot strike to ball release. Then that's how you're generating the power from the foundation, the feet all the way up to implement being thrown. The result is mechanics. So if you're monkeying with somebody's mechanics, you're at the wrong end of the equation. And they were doing that all the time. I suspect that his arm started to hurt him in 1960 or 61. It progressed, teaching a slider incorrectly probably uh, contributed to that as well. And so once he left baseball, he never found a positive distraction. He wasn't an Etonian scholar. He wasn't a guy who loved reading Shakespeare on the sidelines. This is not a guy who had anything that he liked doing except going to bars and drinking, hanging out, having a good time. He was a good guy. But he had nothing that he could get tied into. And boy, that spiral that took him down after that really quickened the pace. Brian Vikander joining us here. He is a, you're a photographer by trade, but you've also been a baseball junkie, right? And, a, and, a, Absolutely. A, and played ball and throw ball. And give everybody your background. Tell them where we can find out a little bit about your, uh, your incredible art over the last four decades. Well, I've had uh, a great career. I've been in 183 countries over the last 35, 38 years, working for National Geographic, the London Times, New York Times, Smithsonian, Geo, Perry Match. Uh, I've had the opportunity to spend time with His Holiness the Dalai Lama, Mother Teresa, former President Carter. Uh, my artist Why are we talking about Steve Dalkowski then? Why are we not discussing? Uh, Can I bring you back on and hear the rest of this? Because I'm in, more sure. interested in that at this point. <laughs> Come on. You can do what you like, Dester. I'm with you, buddy. Well, you know, my wife survived cancer twice and like her bucket list things to go to Africa and do a, a, a safari with her, with the man who saved her life. So we want to do that. I got to do the Northern Lights. That's my little bucket mm -hmm. list thing that I, but I've been on, you know, five continents and moved around a little bit and, you know, probably brought COVID back from Asia last winter. So I've done some things too, <laughs> but I, I'm always more interested in people that have that wanderlust far beyond the, paltry you now 30 or 40 countries I've been to you know what I mean literally well and you know I got into baseball I was a uh, handball player four wall indoor game and things kept coming to me as I was hitting the ball very very hard against the best players uh, push off the rubber well if you had to push off the rubber then you would have had your foot against the back wall and of course I never had that stride length was only 80 percent of what was going on I was out at over 115% over of my stride length hitting the handball. All of these things started to ring in my head, and I started to go back through baseball literature, look at all of the information and pitching, starting back in the 1870s, assembling what was going on, and then started to build out my own program on how to train pitchers. Tell me about Tom House. Tell me about pitchers. Tell me about theory and tell me about, I mean, I've had Leo Mazzoni on a hundred times. He's, you know, Marylander, you know, yeah. so I've talked a lot of pitching with a lot of people. I even DJ Kurt Schilling's wedding, even though we don't speak any longer, ever since the rope and the journalist and the tree, I kind of gave that up. But, um, you know, I, I've talked a lot of pitching, you know what I mean? I, I would sit with uh, Dick Bosman, uh, you know, uh, uh, back in the early nineties and Johnny Oates back before Mr. Angelos took my press pass back in 2006 and I would talk pitching with pitching coaches all the time um Tom House was always an interesting cat to me because he sort of came up through Aparicio's Red Sox in the mid-70s and I had the baseball card and throwing the football you know all of these things that go into the mechanics of how to throw a football how to throw a baseball and I guess I learned that having never been a golfer in my life but having been a tennis player and a baseball player all of my childhood, I had never held a golf club. And when I picked it up, I tried to hold it like a baseball bat. And the first thing my, my teacher says, no, 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 no. Let's, we, we don't do it. And I thought to myself, man, if I just had mechanics the first time I actually picked up a baseball to realize I was throwing it the right way or the wrong way. My dear friend Ray Bachman, who was my longtime producer, we sent him on a junket with the Ripken boys. They did a um, – they did one of those fantasy camps, Brian, and mm -hmm. Ray was probably an old fart then. I don't know, maybe mid-30s, and, you know, he was the guy that blew out his hamstring first morning of, of senior camp or whatever. He went out on this five-day bender in New Jersey where they went to all the ballparks about 15 years ago, and the first thing he reported to me when he came on the show about experiencing this is before we had video cameras. He said, I've been playing baseball my whole life, softball, beer league. I didn't even know how to hold the ball. I, 
didn't know how to hold the ball against the seams, you know? And I'm thinking, you know, I, who instructed my dad, who instructed my little league coach? Who instructed, in the modern era, I would think that there are pitching mechanic people. And I remember I covered high school softball in the late 80s. And there was a guru down in Anne Arundel County that could make the girls go up and under and really, you know, bring the heat. The, the, you couldn't see the ball because the girls were up on top of you because the mound was so close. Um, and, you know, you routinely see one hit softball games in Arundel County. Uh, I did that for three or four years in the late 80s and 90s. But I often wonder how far the science has come 20 years later where all of these cameras, every Mike Elias and Sigma Dell comes in. Is there now one way that this is taught, or is it still completely five or ten different scientific methods that everyone has a different way to teach pitching? There's a lot of similarity in how the theories and paradigms are available. It's the presentation of the information, Nestor. Either you're a communicator or you're not. You've got to be able to get the trust, You've got to be able to establish a solid relationship with somebody. You've got to understand what the pitching mechanics are. As I said, there are three phases to that. More importantly, you've got to be able to understand sports psychology so that you can then share with somebody where their weakness is. Then they have to look back at you and say, I trust that dude. Is that guy going to be okay if I give him this information and we can talk that ingenuously? And that's, that's where it comes together. So there are people. It's like Jung. What did Jung go to school to learn all the stuff he wrote about? Of course not. He got, he got some psychology training, but all the stuff he wrote about in his Red Book is stuff that he developed. Great pitching coaches develop new stuff. Tom House fits into that group. There's no question of that. Dalco is the book. Um, look, man, I got your number now. You're going to get tortured uh, showing me pictures and coming back on and telling me uh, some of your stories. Uh, have you done a book on your, your travels? And I mean, other than just the pictures or no? I haven't done that yet. Have not done that yet, but that's something I do need to do. Hanging with the Mujahideen in 83 when we were sounding against the Russians was great fun, my friend. Dude, I'm not done with you, all right? So I apologize <laughs> for, uh, for missing the call and getting our, our, our signals crossed last week, but I will stay. So tell everybody how to find you other than just the book itself and, and your fabulous artwork out there in the desert. The, the book is at dalcobook.com. I'd also like to mention that at DalcoBook.com, we are going to keep a fluid website available to put all new information that we find about Dalkowski on there. If somebody wants to look at my photographic imagery, they can go to my last name, VikanderPhoto.com. It will show you both my imagery and the writing that I've done associated with the nature of the universal moment. Well... Next time we get together, the world will be our oyster here, Brian Vicander. I appreciate you your time. Uh, and, you know, I know the love. I've done a couple of books myself. It's a, it's a passion project, right? We're, if we all got paid for the hour for doing books, uh, we wouldn't do them. <laughs> that, that's true. That's true, Nestor. <laughs> uh, I'm looking forward to seeing more of your artwork and staying in touch. And uh, I, I love the storytelling. Appreciate you. Thank you very much. The Always book is Dalco. Thanks you guys can you. find it anywhere uh, books are sold. Makes a perfect holiday gift for someone like my pop or anybody that loves baseball. We are WNST.net, AM 1570, Towson, Baltimore, and Baltimore positive and positively getting you ready for the holidays.